It's time for another episode of Espresso Yourself with Chuck. And now, coming to the mic, your host, Chuck. Welcome to another episode of Espresso Yourself with Chuck. I am pleased today to have not only the president of the Kansas Chamber, but one of our JAG-K Board of Directors members. So please help me welcome Alan Cobb. Welcome, Alan. Thanks, Chuck. Uh, I have just normal drip coffee in my hand, not not espresso. Well, but, truth be told, I'm I'm going with coffee too. Yeah, but, I I like espresso, but don't have an espresso uh, machine, so I have to go with drip coffee. It used to be called Coffee with Chuck, but then there was another podcast called Coffee with Chuck, so we had yeah. to make we had to make the change. But anyway, we're really glad you're here. Uh, you and I have known each other for a long time, uh, both grew up in the Wichita area, you in Wichita, and, and I grew up in Augusta. Uh, let's start there. Tell us a little bit about your youth, uh, a little bit about your family and growing up. Sure. I grew up uh, on the outskirts of Wichita, rural Sedgwick County, but I was in the Wichita School District. Actually, was, I don't know, three miles from Andover, but uh, eight miles from Wichita Southeast, where I graduated. But um kind of before everybody moved out in the country, had a couple acres. Dad worked in Andover, which is why we moved from Valley Center to the east side of Wichita in the early 70s. Really loved my schools, Minnehaha, Coleman, and Wichita Southeast. Most of my close lifelong friends are the friends I made at Wichita Southeast. So we're on text strings about some things that we can't talk about on this, this thing, but um, enjoyed it. Um, went to Wichita State. Um, and uh, then the University of Pennsylvania, and then, and then law school. I guess other things as, as the relates to career, et cetera. I had the great fortune of being a hired hand on a on a dairy farm uh, outside of Wichita, and it milked about seventy cows, which I thought was an enormous amount of uh, number of cows. Which you can't really make a living milking seventy cows, and they also sold raw milk, so they had a small retail plus plus uh, the farming and dairy. And it just, who doesn't want to work on a farm? I learned to drive a tractor at age 12 and 13 and playing with animals. Now you got to be careful because they're big and dairy cows are pretty docile. Dairy bulls are not docile, which is why you rarely see dairy bulls. Um, they're meaner than than beef bulls, but just learned a whole bunch of, of, of things. Um, certainly hard work. Uh, that was, that certainly certainly part of it. And I'm still friends with the the farm family that I worked for. They were not a whole lot older than me. And then they moved to um, outside of Hope, in between Hope and Harrington. The And so my summer after my junior year of high school, I was their live-in hired hand before I started my senior year. And just that doesn't happen very often anymore. And it was just a, a wonderful experience. And I thought I wanted to be a vet, a veterinarian, and then I actually worked for a small animal vet in Wichita, my senior year of high school. And then, you know, it took me probably years to figure out what I really wanted to do. Probably still trying to figure that out. But um, so that I, that might be relevant or people might have some some interest in that. I have three brothers and sisters, uh, older, older brother, older sister, younger sister. Uh, we're all adopted. We were all adopted essentially at birth. Uh, I say, you know, four, five, six, seven weeks. And we were all born in Kansas City, Missouri, which uh, is at the time when there were a lot of adoptions was basically the maternity adoption headquarters of the U.S. And an incredible number, high percent of babies adopted from 45 to 70 were in Kansas City, like 20 percent or something. Partly it was they already had maternity hospitals and then it was central part of the country. So that's when you still had rail travel. And it was easy, easy to get to. So I always like uh, telling that that part of uh, part of my story and, and still stay close with my siblings. That's great. When did you decide that you didn't want to be a veterinarian? Was it in school? And well, so you went to college. Did you think at that time you wanted to be a vet still or, or I, how did that change? I always hesitate to say, but I, 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 someone can, I don't know that it's in, uh, on, I don't think I have anything from high school in my resume anymore. I worked for a, a veterinarian in Wichita who just kind of soured me on the profession. And I, in hindsight, uh, I think he was a good vet. 
I mean, technically, but he was kind of mailing the rest of it in. You know, the office was a wreck, wasn't updating it, had a little bit of a mean streak. And um, I can recall he actually berated me in front of one of his uh, his clients. And look, he, I deserve the criticism. Um, is you, you know, you put dogs under to clean their teeth, or at least you used to. And then... Um, there was some dog food in the hair. I mean, it is not ideal, but it was not worth the berating I got in front of somebody. And when he was leaving, I said, Hey, Dr. Gump up there. I said it, um, doctor, this is going to be my last day. Uh, that was what you do at age 18, right? <laughs> yeah, I, I do not recommend that, uh, as you get, uh, as you get older. And, uh, so that was, and maybe, but again, you make those decisions at 18, like he, sh that shouldn't have soured me on being a vet. But yeah, you know, I had all kinds of broad interest and and uh, didn't uh, did not go to K. Well, I guess you could go to K State as a vet school and still be a Wichita State undergrad, but just completely shifted over to to different lines of thinking about as far as my career. When you graduated from Wichita State, did you know at that time, or did you think you knew at that time what your career was going to be, and what was your first job after Wichita State? I did not, and I. I don't, I bet I changed majors officially two or three times. You know, you actually go into wherever you go and change. I probably changed mentally 10 times. It's like, okay, I'm going to finish this semester. And so I really did not know what I wanted to do. I, uh, Jean Elliott was a counselor at Wichita State. Uh, she, she was great. I give her a, a ton, a ton of credit for getting me steered into, frankly, what is kind of my career today. She said, well, what do you enjoy? What do you like doing? What interests you? And she said, well, you might want to think about a master's of public administration. And we looked through the requirements. Uh, I, uh, I graduated with a bachelor's of general studies in four years. That was the degree I could get done in four years. And I highly recommend the degree because they don't allow you to concentrate to get a major. So I had hours of stats, uh, up to calculus, econ, public administration classes, uh, psychology, history, and but it was good enough to get me to a master's program, which then uh, went to the University of Pennsylvania, thinking I wanted to be a city manager. But again, you know, you're 22 years old, and I don't know if I just want to move around the country or, or the state, because that is a career for a lot of city managers. <laughs> And I knew I wanted to be somewhere in the public policy, public sphere, whether it's politics or policy. And then I guess I wanted to delay my decision for three more years. So then I went to law school. And when it came back to Kansas, because I, I was interested in politics and public policy and went to Washburn instead of KU, mainly because it's in the capital. I know KU is only 20 minutes away, but it's just a lot easier to be engaged and was able to get a, a job working for a lobbyist while I was in law school. And uh, actually when I was at University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia, worked for a small, uh, a township. Uh, they just their local government is different. It's like three towns, but they have one township that governs the the three small cities. So that, that was a good experience. And I, you know, looking back on it, no computers. I don't know how we got anything done. Uh, I mean, I, you know, I guess I was handwriting memos and that's right when fax machines came out, uh, or a little bit afterwards. Um, I guess I, I did when I was at Wichita State. I had a, a worked for a maintenance supply company, and uh, they had an office in Hutchinson, and it was almost like magical. Oh, you can send faxes. I mean, this is nineteen eighty six, eighty seven, eighty eight, and um, uh, it, I just always found that interesting. Because faxes were pretty cool for a long, long time, and now. Uh, I can't remember what I, I was on something or uh, somebody wanted the, the the chamber fax number. We don't have a fax. <laughs> so, right. Uh, so you um, were a lobbyist while you were in law school. A lot of people hear the term lobbyist, and sometimes there's a negative connotation to that. Can you explain what you do as a lobbyist, the purpose of lobbyists in the the public process? Yeah, and it does have a negative connotation for, for some, and I, some of it's deserved, some of it's not. But I guess you could really, the softer way to describe what a lobbyist does is an advocate. You're advocating for, if you are uh, what call, is called a contract lobbyist, you have multiple clients, not unlike a law firm, and you're advocating for those clients. 
for me now as the president of the chamber, we, the chamber, and me personally, we advocate on behalf of our members. And there are nonprofit lobbyists, there's government lobbyists, there's some companies will have their own lobbyists, uh, trade associations uh, like the Kansas Chamber. And so we're advocating to pass bill, good bill, what we consider good bills, and then hopefully defeat bad bills. And um, and educating legislators on on points of view about about issues, and also we'll, we certainly have conversations with the executive branch on certain issues, certain things that are happening, or regulations that may be proposed, so that they they hear our perspective about that. And how long were you a lobbyist then? Well, gosh, I mean, depends on well how you define it. Maybe all but two or three years of my adult life in one way or another. Um, and, but it's always been, it's always been really Kansas. And I, I, I guess I did, a t I've done a teeny bit of federal lobbying, but not enough that they have these reporting requirements that if you lobby X amount, and I can't remember if it's dollars or time, you have to register as a federal lobbyist. That's never reached a threshold where I've had to register as a, as a federal lobbyist. So, um, I, you know, I advocate, I don't know. Both terms are accurate. It just depends on a, a viewpoint. Sure. Um, but you, you worked, know. you worked, I think, was it Mary Ellen Conley yeah. when you were? Okay. Uh, so you worked for her while you were in law school. Then you graduated uh, from law school, law school, you earned your, your JD, your, your uh, law degree. Uh, and then what was your next job? After it was working for, for Mary Ellen full time. I mean, it was, she was kind of being an entrepreneur. I took a, a, a fairly enormous risk. The pay was not great, but it was like, hey, can we, I mean, it was a risk for her too. Um, I don't even want to say how low the starting salary I agreed to, because uh, even if you look at that 1992, people would say, what, what are you doing? And, but it, we were taking a risk on growing the business and getting into broader sense of public affairs. I think she thought it would be good to have a licensed attorney on her team. Um, and then, uh, gosh, ooh, about a year after I started full-time, one of her primary clients hired her in-house. And I know she felt bad, but the salary they were offering her, I said, Mary Ellen, do not worry about me. I mean, I'll figure things out. And then I was kind of forced to, to open up my own firm and had talked to other lobbyists and talked to law firms and I thought, you know what, I'm just going to try to make a, a go of myself. And it and ended up working out that I had clients to decide, yeah, we'd, we'd like to to hire Alan. So it worked out. Got, I was fortunate. And, and you did that for a while, but you've also worked for at least one elected official um, that I'm aware of. When did you decide to make that change? And actually, instead of being on the advocacy side, uh, on the on the public side, actually work for an elected official and That's, more directly. So, so I, in 1995, took a job with, with uh, Senator Bob Dole in his Senate office in Kansas City, Kansas. And it was kind of funny. Some of the fellow lobbyists would joke that, hey, you're switching teams. Um, and I don't know. They they came to me. I, I didn't wasn't aware of the job being open and and I don't know that I, well, this is with all due respect to every other elected official in Kansas. I don't know that I would have switched if it was somebody other than Bob Dole. He was the Republican majority leader. President. I knew he was going to run for president. Um, I've always had a ton of, of respect for Senator Dole. In fact, I, I don't know if you can see it, but I have a campaign poster next uh, on the below the window from his 92 campaign of a, of a poster. And it, and that was great experience too. I guess some some advice when folks ask me is, you can't ignore the financial side of it, but get as many of the experiences as you can. And now most of my experiences were all kind of contained within public policy government, but um, it uh, I, I I was hired as his deputy state director, and so was a gen another gentleman here in Topeka. Um, never lived in the Kansas City area, uh, although I was born there, but lived there for six weeks, and and never really spent much time in Kansas City, Kansas. So that was an experience, and he basically hired 
I was hired and along with somebody else because his whole team knew he was going to run for president and they wanted to add some staff to kind of keep the home fires burning. And during the two years I worked for him, I mean, a year and a half, and then it, Bob Dole became Sheila Fromm, which we, we could talk about just the process. Uh, my job was to basically visit, it was almost like a sales territory, the eastern, basically the eastern three counties over from Pittsburgh all the way up to, to Atchison and Donovan County. And during my time, I spoke at every single Rotary Lions Club, Kiwanis, and Optimus Club, and I'm looking at a map right above me in that whatever 20, 20 county area, um, and what great experience, and visited with mayors, and then um, would just attend the community meetings, and was just, you know, that's what you do, and we did some constituent stuff for sure, but that was not my expertise, and I'll, I'll never forget the first time I spoke to a Rotary is Overland Park Rotary. And this is when Rotaries had 250 people. I was nervous. I stayed up late, got up early, almost like I was cramming for a final. And, I mean, I was nervous. And that was actually the very first speech. And then I immediately got on the road to, I don't, I can't remember if it was Parsons or Coffeeville or Independence. And by the, uh, probably by the next, um, oh, by in a couple of days, I wasn't even preparing because I was giving the same speech every time. And then I could anticipate questions. And I, that's just, it was a good experience to, to be a public speaker. I'm not a great public speaker, but I just don't get nervous. And whether it's a room, I guess the largest has probably been a thousand, but, uh, and then just understanding more how the federal government works. I was more of a state government person. And then also the politics where first time I worked for a politician, and I remember kind of having a philosophical question with friends, like if you're an elected leader, whether it's a Governor Kelly or Senator Dole, do you lead the public or do you do what the do what the public wants? And that's the constant challenge with an elected official. And I was talking to my brother-in-law, oh, they got to do what the public wants. I said, well, what, what if the public wants isn't a very good decision because the public just doesn't have time to get informed? They just, it's not that they're low information, but they're running a business, they're working 80 hours a week, grandkids, kids, grandparents, whatever. And so that was the first time that that question kind of, and it still sticks with me today. And as you see it, do you, do you follow the quote unquote will of the people or do you follow your conscience or do you try to figure out some kind of combination thereof? And I think different elected officials do it different ways and they, I don't know that they make their decisions the same way every time. Obviously, uh, Senator Dole, uh, is an icon not only in the state but internationally uh and but but have there been some other elected officials that you have kind of looked at as as maybe doing their job really well yeah tim schallenberger he is a current state senator and he was the speaker of the house and then i i was his campaign manager and he ran for for governor and in 2002 losing to to kathleen sebelius uh, which another part of the career that was a risk on my part, but everything's turned out fine. I just found Tim, um, just so even tempered, and he could be he was very, very funny. And so sometimes he'd kind of have that Bob Dole wit. And if it gets printed in the newspaper, it looks like he's being tart or sharp, but no, you got to understand Tim's tone. And he was a, a terrific legislator, he just knew how to get things done. There was not a lot of rancor among, at that point, you had moderates, conservatives, and Democrats. I think uh, all parties highly respected him in his four years as, as speaker. And so that so it worked for him as uh, not as him being elected official, but him being a candidate. And then I've been a, a consultant for, for Mike Pompeo's re-election campaign in 2014 and Pat Roberts' re-election in 2014. And have a high deal of respect for both true public servants um worked worked hard took it very very seriously of, of their job and both have significant pieces of legislation that they're responsible for I, obviously pat roberts served a long time mike served Oh, I should know this. Did he did he serve six years and then he was CIA director? Something like that. Maybe he was years. elected in 2010. 
Okay, so the real started fourteen was his last. So he's reelected in sixteen. So he served he served six years and change uh, before he was nominated and confirmed as CIA director, and then nominated and confirmed as U.S. Secretary of State in whatever during the Trump administration, whatever time frame that was. Sure. So eventually, there was an opening at the Kansas Chamber. And you were obviously hired as the president and and CEO. I think you have both titles. Um, Tell us about making that transition. And then I want to talk a little bit more about the chamber itself and then what your role is there. Sure. Well, I'd actually uh, was on the Trump campaign as a consultant and served in the Trump administration during transition. So that's basically November, December, January. That was interesting too. I mean, that transition, uh, being on the transition team, and my responsibilities were Department of Ag, and then also what they call public liaison, just kind of uh, having public meetings with the League of Municipalities, having public meetings with the Farm Bureau, with the NFIB, uh, unions, et cetera, U.S. Chamber. And then I decided to run for Congress. So Mike Pompeo was nominated, and so that opened up his seat. The process is hundred. you have to get a majority of 125 delegates. So every state does it differently. I don't think it's the best way, but I don't know that it's not the best way. And Ron Estes, who currently serves one, I did get second. So I, I, I'm i glad I got second. And it was a kind of a crowded field. I had no hard feelings. I'm not, I don't, I think I ended up with a better job. And uh, Ron Estes and I will joke about that. But he is doing a fantastic job in Congress. Uh, we get along very, very well. And then I thought, okay, that didn't work out. That was mid-February. I'm just going to sit back and not rush into something. Let me figure out exactly what I want to do. And got a call from the chairman of the chamber like two weeks into my contemplative period and thought, well, yes, I obviously should would be seriously interested in this. Uh, I know about the chamber. I served on the chamber board 20 years ago and it's here in Topeka. I mean, there's a practicality of it. It's a significant job that I don't have to move. And I, and I know, knew a lot of the folks that were on the staff, knew a lot of the board members. And so I've been, I will have been at the chamber for seven years in about a month. And it's not my longest employer of all time. It's the longest single job I've had. And I know I, you know I've gotten all kinds of advice as, as you have. I remember one I got when I was in my thirties that if you've been at the same job for five years, you're mailing it in or you're coasting. I don't believe that. It just, it's, I, maybe when you're younger trying to rise up, I guess, and whatever we consider rise up, but just like you, you don't, there's not a bigger, better job at Jack K for you. There's not a bigger, better job for the chamber and it's constantly changing. So there's no way to mail it in. Because everything is, it's different. I don't know if it's different every day, but it's different every week, every month. And uh, partly because it's politics and policy, but uh, great job. I feel very, very fortunate that I don't know what else I would want to do. Um, don't I want to live in Kansas. Uh, wife and I live here, three kids. Uh, well, I do have a son in Kansas City, Missouri, but it's close. And it just... It's kind of ideal. So I, again, I feel fortunate. You mentioned earlier the chamber advocates for uh, what it considers good policy uh, for its members. What else does the chamber do? Um, I consider what we do, we have really three things. Hard advocacy, which I'd say, hey, governor, veto this bill, don't veto the bill. Um, legislature pass the bill, kill the bill. So that's hard advocacy. Uh, or and also administrative rules and regs. And then the soft advocacy we have is essentially celebrating, promoting, educating people about business. We have a minority business summit. We have a, a business expo that we have next month and uh, where businesses get together and share best practices ideas. We have a women in business conference. We have a manufacturing summit every fall, coolest thing made in Kansas. So it's a way for companies to get people to vote for them. And that celebrates business. We also have a coolest innovation in Kansas, which is a little different. A coolest thing made in Kansas is pure popular vote. Whoever can get the most people to vote. Coolest innovation, we actually have a panel of judges. 
uh, of business leaders and folks at universities, et cetera. And then we've done a manufacturing bus tour where we, four days, 25 cities, all four corners of the state, where we take tours of manufacturing facilities. And Kansas has a ton of cool things. Everybody knows about airplanes, which are still very, very cool to see them being made. But Kansas makes so many different things that are world, world leaders or market leaders. Uh, just the, yes, the, I, I guess Cessna is the Cessna Beechcraft people know about that. So I guess I'd call that the soft advocacy. And, and then uh, we have three different leadership programs that were a part of Leadership Kansas, which is a class of 40 every year, where it's uh, two and a half days a month for six months. I think we might have moved it to seven. And where you get a class of 40 to visit different parts of the state and understand those local issues and or some policy conversations. And it's not the only touristy part of it is if you get out there early, you might play golf at, at Buffalo Dunes and Garden City. But the rest of it, I, you know, if you want to call taking a tour of a beatpacking plant tourism, I guess you can. But that, although it's fascinating. And so we go all different areas of the state. And one thing uh, I say at the orientation, and it's I'm kind of joking, kind of not. Kansas is a big state geographically. If you grew up, I, I just I'll, I'll say for me personally, <clears throat> excuse me, growing up in Wichita, the second time I was ever in Topeka was when I went to Topeka to look for an apartment for law school. And the first time was sixth grade field trip. Never been in Pittsburgh, never been in Garden City, had been in Dodge City. The very first time I sat foot in Kansas City, Kansas, not driving through it, was my first day on the job working for Bob Dole. Now, obviously, KCK is a lot different. You have more people going there, the racetrack, uh, casinos, et cetera. But that's Kansas. You grew up in Pittsburgh, probably have, may not have been in Hayes, grew up in Garden City. Um, you may not have been to Topeka. I don't. I doubt they're, they're doing field trips. It's just too far. Um, grew up in Topeka, haven't been in Pitt, to Pittsburgh or Dodge City. And then I joke, if you grew up in Johnson County, you haven't been anywhere in the state. And all the Johnson County people laugh because they know there's a grain of, of uh, truth to it. Um, but I think it's eye-opening for the folks that go through the class about, oh, I had no idea this is happening in Garden City. I had no idea this is happening in Hutchinson, Salina, or even Wichita. I mean, I'll go back to Wichita. We've been able to uh, I tag along. I was in the class three years ago, and I can tag along the other ones. And I've had tours of both Spirit and Textron Aviation, big planes, small planes. Pretty fascinating uh, to see them and uh, and to see how they they get made. I, the one thing that I'm remembering at the seven the, the Spirit Air Systems in Wichita makes the seven eighty seven nose cone and all the avionics. When you go to that factory, it's quiet. It's like it's not you don't hear riveting and. I honestly, that was the most notable thing is how quiet it was. 737 factory is a little louder, but uh, it's so with that's Leadership Kansas. We just started something called Emerging Leaders. Uh, Leadership Kansas are folks, you know, 30 ish to 60 ish or so. Um, K, uh, leader, uh, Emerging Leaders is more 22 to 35. And it's somewhat similar, but not exact. And we actually include some leadership training from the Kansas Leadership Center in Wichita for those young emergent leaders. And then the third thing, this is not our program that we sponsor, it's called Eagle U that I think you're aware of, Chuck, um, which is a week-long program for youth from 15 to 25, although most of the folks that go through it are 15 to 20. It's at Baker University in Baldwin City. And it's a week-long training of how to have uh, to have some career uh, career skills. It is such, to me, is such a good match with Jag K. And I know there's been a lot of Jag K kids go through it. Memorization skills, financial literacy. It's things that you can do in a week that may not fit kind of in an academic setting like at a, at a Jag K. So those are the three things. So that's, that's what the chamber does. Well, and, and the chamber has been, you personally, obviously, but the chamber has been very supportive of JAG K. You mentioned the manufacturing bus tour. We've been allowed to, to be a part of that. Eagle U has been life changing for many of our students. Our elected state and regional career association officers 
are allowed that opportunity through the support of the chamber and and uh, the Eagle U folks are great. So uh, we've appreciated that and and really excited about celebrating with you all a hundred years of the chamber. Yeah, uh, it's our hundredth anniversary started a hundred years ago. And why do chambers get started, state or local? It's usually to solve a problem. So you, if you think about what's happening in 1924. Automobiles were exploding. Everybody had one. There was not a great system of roads in Kansas. So that's why the Kansas Chamber initially got started in 1924. And once they got started and made a difference on, on having the state actually spend some money on roads, so what other problems can we solve? And we do have, I should have looked this up, Chuck, before this. We have dozens of companies that have been members with us for 100 years, which is unusual in, in that, because companies get bought and sold, someone retires, whatever, but we can trace uh, several dozen back to 19, 1924, which is which is pretty exciting. Well, well, we know there will probably be problems to solve 100 years from now. Yes. Um, what do you foresee as some of the more immediate challenges facing the chamber or the, the state that you will look to address? I think the some of the challenges for Kansas, uh, we have so many opportunities. So I'm optimistic, but we're a slow growth state. And now there are states that are shrinking, you know, more people moving out. Um, and it, it, some of it is policy. It's not all about taxes, but making sure we have enough economic opportunity for the folks that live here, but also that we can attract folks. Um the reality is mo a lot of economic growth happens in large metro areas. And we don't we don't have a large Kansas metro area because you got Kansas City that's split between the state line, a uh, metro area of 2 million people. I think China has 75 metro areas of 2 million people. And then we have Wichita, which I would call a medium metro. And then Topeka, Lawrence, Manhattan, are all kind of small metros. Um, so and, and then it had, everything stopped during COVID, but I'm starting to see those trends. Like, why do cities grow? Because they grow. That's not exactly right. But so that is a challenge. And although there's plenty of uh, rural Kansas counties that are gaining a population, now they're not gaining a lot, but they're not losing. And that that's a positive thing. And why do people move to places? It's almost all if you're not retiring, it's also almost always because of a job economic opportunity. It's not because of a park. It's not because of a coffee shop downtown. Um, those things always follow the economic growth. But the, the world, the middle class, um, Yes, we have a lot of global tensions, as many as Chuck, you and I are about the same age, as long as many as I can remember uh, ever. Um, and uh, but the, the middle class is exploding, particularly in South America, Africa and the developing world of Asia. Obviously, Japan, South Korea um, are developed. But what do they want when they have a little bit of money? Well, they want to travel. They want to travel in airplanes. Um, China does not have that many more civilian airfields than Kansas does. So there's growth. There are some you know, challenges with uh, China being an adversary and all, all of those things. And also what you do when you get to the middle class, you want to have more protein in your diet, which is beef, pork, chicken. And we produce that. And obviously produce a lot of wheat. Um, and also technology. Kansas is a lot bigger technology state than people realize, whether it's it's software, some hardware, or financial technology. And what do people want? They want secure bank accounts and be able to access on the app. So we're we provide in Kansas what the world is wanting and wanting wanting more and more of. And also we're a long, long ways from e aviation. So the, all those airplanes are going to need jet fuel. And we have three refineries that produce that produce fuel, and then we're a top ten oil and gas state. So, um, so I, that that's the optimism. It's the challenge of well, uh, the growth uh, growth not happening in 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 metro areas. But I, I think there's a lot of things to be optimistic about uh, for the state of Kansas. You've had a couple of mentors, at least uh, in your life. What? was the best piece of advice maybe someone you looked to as a mentor gave you? Well, the, so I probably got some good advice from folks that weren't necessarily mentors, like a professor. <clears throat> One was 
don't turn down a job until it's been offered. I mean, how, how many times we go, ah, I really don't want that job. Well, just then don't go interview for it, but don't, don't turn it down. Um, and also don't accept it until it's been offered. Uh, the other is probably more observational uh, with Mary Ellen Conley, just kept her cool, was able to deal with complex issues, didn't mind um, saying, hey, I don't know. Well, we got to research this thing. Uh, Mike Morgan and I worked at Coke Industries, helped me kind of navigate the world of, of kind of big business. I mean, Coke is such an interesting thing where they are a big, big business, but they can operate so much like a small business. Because Most of their folks are from Kansas and they're, they're organized in a way that you, they don't have a, a big a big bureaucracy. And I think a lot of it is, I would say, temperament and observing. And how, how do you deal with conflict? How do you deal with tension? How do you deal with tough conversations that you that you have to have with either your boss or a subordinate or a uh, just a, a colleague? So those are probably the lessons I've learned. Haven't always applied to 100 percent, but uh, that certainly uh, was fortunate to have have those mentors early on. And I, I guess I'd say the, the farm family I, I worked for, Doug and Jane Wolf. Here's a young couple, multi, you know, farms are very capital intensive and talk about a work ethic, dairy farm up every day at four o'clock. Uh, the cows have to be milked twice a day. And but also then being able to get everything else done around the farm and also being able to have fun and, and enjoy life. Uh, to one of the very quick thing back to the farm where I can't looking back on it, I can't believe he did it, but he and his wife had to go on a vacation. They had two young kids. Well, they left me in charge of the farm for a week, uh, milking the cows both times a day. I was the only hired hand and also making sure the milk jugs were washed. Um, I, I loved it. And I, but looking back, it's like, you left a 16 year old in charge of the farm. And, uh, it, you know, it wasn't a huge farm, 300 acres, 60, 70 cows with their calves to be fed, calves that are being born. Uh, I knew when I needed to call the vet, et cetera, but just have had um, great opportunities to have a lot of responsibility at a uh, at a, a young age. And so certainly, uh, it certainly was a mentor or somebody I looked up to also it was Doug Wolf, Doug and Jane Wolf. What do you look for in an employee or a prospective employee? Main thing is culture, temperament, those. And now that's also hard to tease out during an interview, right? Now, I will say the 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 folks, we have not hired a ton of people at during my tenure at the chamber, but we, we do look for, uh, we just hired someone to do social media. Well, now social media is something that could be taught, um, but so you look at the competence, but I, you know, sometimes I think that can be overdone, depends on the job. Right. Uh, like, you know, we're not hiring um, a nuclear engineer here at the chamber uh, or an accountant. And I think the the ability to deal with conflict, uh, I'm big on the challenge process, but it's got to be done in an appropriate way. Meaning I know everybody in this office has no problem disagreeing with me. I like it. Now, it needs to be done professionally. And and sometimes if it, even if it's not professional, if it's, if it's joking. I mean, does that make sense? It's, uh, you know, oh, no, Alan, that's a really stupid idea. But if it's done in a joking way, it doesn't bother me. It's not disrespectful. And so that's that's certainly what I look for, who can play well with others and can accept, they themselves can accept, accept challenges, but are they willing to challenge you or a colleague? So you get the best decisions made. I mean, ultimately, I think a lot about leadership at whatever level is you got to make a decision. You can't just not make the decision. And then what leads you to make that decision? How did you get the best information? You're never going to have perfect information. There's always going to be unknowns. And then how do you? How does your team around you help you make those those uh, those decisions? You have been on the JAG K board of directors about as long as you've been president. Yeah. Chamber, and we've certainly appreciated that because we know how busy you are, and and you've been an active participant. Why serve on the JAG K board with everything else you have going on in your life? Well, I didn't know about JAG K until you called me after I I got. I mean, I think I'd heard it or seen the logo, but didn't really know. And then once you describe what it does, is like, yeah, I want to be a part of it. There's probably a practical side to 
we have workforce challenges in Kansas. This is certainly workforce, but I, so that's probably a part of it, but just, and you've heard me say this, the things that JAG K does, and I know the focus is on a very particular uh, old demographic, a particular type of student. I, too bad you can't have JAG K for every single high school student in Kansas. And I said it teams so well with Eagle U where you're learning career skills. And I know I had, and I also had early exposure to JAG K. I, I'm on, uh, or a member of the Topeka Downtown Rotary. And one of the volunteer things was to have, um, it was almost like, I, it was at Highland Park and it was um, like mentoring or lessons in small, small talk. And it, it was awesome. It's like, what if I would have had this exposure at age 18 or 17 about how you have small talk. Now, some of the kids intentionally were being provocative and it was kind of funny, uh, but others just, you know, they, they were just good. Hey, well, what do you do? Why do you do it? Where are you from? Uh, and so that was, that was an exposure that really opened my eyes. And then just coming to the board meetings, well, I mean, my goodness, your student leaders, these are going to be very, very successful because that, that's most of what we get exposed to right at the board are the student leaders of JAG-K. I mean, it's unbelievable. I mean, I, it's such a great, a great program. Now, sometimes I wonder, Chuck, yeah, why do you have to have a separate program? Why aren't the high schools already doing this? But I kind of know the answer. I mean, it's just, just the way things fit. Or, you know, there's some folks from different households are going to kind of get some of this training through their household, through their parents, or, uh, through jobs uh, that they have. So I'm I'm uh, thrilled to be a part of Jack Kane. You, you do such a great job. All the, the career specialists that I've met, every single one of them, um, literally doing the Lord's work. And the enthusiasm for their kids, for their job, I mean, it's contagious. And uh, and I do, I think, sometimes to their financial detriment, just of the way things, salaries and capers and all that, right? Just, um, and so it's a, what a, what a great program. Well, thank you. And you've been a great supporter and we appreciate that. Finally, what do you do for fun? I have three dogs that have to be walked every day. And now when one of them uh, two of them I can take off the leash and one of them I can't. It is not fun when I'm chasing a dog, which <laughs> doesn't happen because I just, but I'm training him to come back. Uh, Holly and I, my wife and I like uh, traveling, but we're both busy and don't travel as much. We do a lot of hiking, a lot of outdoorsy stuff. Um, uh, I, I have uh, climbed seven 14ers in Colorado. Those are the 14,000 foot peaks. Holly, Holly and I did Pikes Peak a couple of years ago. And because uh, you got to start really early because the thunderstorms come in. So like 430, you need to be on the trail. Wow. Well, it's dark. We missed a turn. We went an extra two miles and an extra thousand feet. But it's like, OK, we're still going. We're still going to go to the summit, which we which we did. Um, and enjoy You know what I really like? I'm I really like show TV series or movies about spies. And I probably have two of them going on right now. And uh, I, it, it's, it, you know, I, every time the Hunt for Red October comes on, even though I've seen it 50 times, I watch it. But I don't know why. Maybe that would have been my other careers being a spook for the CIA. I'm not sure. But I enjoy that for fun, for sure. Great. Well, thanks again for your time, for your support of JAG K. We appreciate the chamber and we appreciate you, Alan Cobb. And this is another episode of Espresso Yourself with Chuck. Thanks, Chuck. Thanks for watching Espresso Yourself with Chuck. I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope you will subscribe to the channel and also check out all the videos on our Jobs for America's Graduates Kansas YouTube site. Music for Espresso Yourself with Chuck is provided by Ben Sound Music at bensound.com. Thank you to our announcer, Kelly Newton, and producers Kim Fertig and Don Muir.